Well, it's a pleasure for me to be at uh, this August school, and uh, I'm very impressed with your location. You, know, you have luxury all around you. Patek Philippe and Gucci and all that. <laughs> Who chose this location, I wonder? Well, I so I'll, I'll just talk a little about that, then we move on to the guiding principles of Pakistan's foreign policy. And the guiding principles are always, you know, they can stem from, they're, they're all kind of interrelated. From there, we move on to the contemporary, which is the Prime Minister, you know, the current Prime Minister we have, Prime Minister Mawaspi, his vision of a peaceful neighborhood. And then we sort of we, uh, conclude. And he was part of India, as you know, British India. Um, you know, like, and it was created for Muslims of India to sort of, you know, to have their own sort of, you know, like, country, you know, their own land where they could live as per their ideas. So that is, in a way, the two nation theory. That is an ideology. Pakistan is an Islamic state, technically, you know, not Islamic state as such, but an Islamic republic, you know, basically. Because this Daesh has spread a lot of confusion about what could be an Islamic mm -hmm. state. Um, so, so let's not use those terms. <laughs> Islamic Republic is, you know, like basically, uh, so it's a Muslim majority country where sort of, you know, like Islam is the state religion. Here, we have had democracy for the last 60, 70 years. Then the role of civil society, I mean, you know, we all are familiar with that. This is something, you know, like, which is more and more uh, becoming a factor in terms of domestic policies as well as foreign policy. In terms of the external determinants, you have the global environment. Now, how can global environment affect you, for instance? Any examples? One of the biggest examples we can have is 9-11, the 9-11 attacks in America. That, uh, sort of, you know, that event, which basically happened in one day, changed the world order in many ways. Um, then, of course, for instance, when you have the end of Cold War, you know, there are cataclysmic uh, events sometimes in the world which have a global, which have global implications. Um, your neighborhood is very important. We are in a very challenging neighborhood. Um, you know, like we have India on our east, with which we have had some sort of, you know, like rather very checkered history of relations. We have Afghanistan on our west. We have Afghan, uh, Iran on our southwest. We have China, um, you know, on our, you know, um, on our east, again, northeast. So I'd like to read a statement here from um, Muhammad al Jinnah, whom we call the great leader Kaidaza. This handsome looking guy in a suit. Um, so he said, and I'll quote, Our foreign policy is one of friendliness and goodwill towards all the nations of the world. We do not cherish aggressive designs against any country or nation. We believe in the principle of honesty and fair play in national and international dealings, and are prepared to make our utmost contribution to the promotion of peace and prosperity amongst the nations of the world. So that was the vision of Mr. Jinnah. Um, you know, like, you know, so like this, as, as if there was some contradiction between Islam and democracy. There is no such thing. Could be, there could be nothing farther from the truth. <coughs> For those who know, so if you know, who are familiar with the history of Islam, democracy was part and parcel of Islam at a time when there were monarchies all around the world. Uh, caliphs, you know, even the first caliphs, you know, the. The caliphs were elected, not appointed, you know, uh, and that is, you know, like the, the very inception of Islamic history. And then between Pakistan and all those countries, um, then again, you know, like many of them bring ideas to Pakistan, you know, after living abroad for 10, 15 years, they come back. So they bring new technologies as well, sometimes they bring capital as well, so, you know, like it's a very important language. So we, we, we kind of, uh, you know, like, we have to safeguard their interest because their interest is in our interest. Then ensuring optimal utilization of natural resources, for regional and national cooperation, uh, goes without saying, you know. Um, you know, we are a developing country. We have to ensure that we uh, make the best possible use of our resources. 
for instance, to give you an example again, Pakistan has a potential of producing maybe over 100,000 megawatts of energy through, um, through hydro projects. You know? Now, that would be safe energy, that would be uh, <coughs> you know, like clean energy, you know, that potential is there. But to, to exploit and utilize that potential, we need this sort of, you know, like the support um, in terms of technology, uh, we need support in terms of capital from World Bank, for instance, you know, uh, technologically, you know, like we need, uh, you know, because we would want to you know, employ the most advanced technologies in the world. For clean energy, for instance, uh, Germany is uh, sort of, you know, is a kind of world leader. We would like to collaborate with Germany for uh, increasing our clean, uh, energy production. For instance, for solar, we are blessed with 320 days of sun, um, which reminds me, it's kind of gloomy these days. Isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, terrorism is a problem for the world today. Um, whether it's the US, whether it's Europe, what happened in 9-11, in, in what happened in, into that region, uh, you know, through an operation. And then, you know, okay, they fought against the Russians. And, and to be fair to them, they fought well against the Russians. The Russians had to leave eventually. It was not just because of them, it was because of the other factors as well. But they were one factor, a big factor in that. After that, when the Russians left Afghanistan, suddenly they thought, oh, if we could beat the second superpower of the world, then we could perhaps even beat the first superpower of the world. You know? Many of them turned against the West, against the Americans, and then of course, you know, like we had all those Al-Qaeda and everything. Now Al-Qaeda turned against the Americans first, when they felt that the Pakistan was supporting America, they turned against Pakistan. You know, the Taliban, uh, you know, who were sort of, you know, like they were kind of, they were basically the war children of, they were the war orphans. They were orphans of that war, uh, you know, between the Mujahideen and the Russians. They <coughs> were able to occupy Afghanistan because there was a vacuum there, you know, because of the civil war going on. But subsequently, Taliban, when they collaborated with Osama bin Laden, Al Qaeda, and uh, following 9/11, they had uh, you know when the Americans invaded Afghanistan to defeat Al Qaeda and defeat Taliban because Taliban refused to leave Al Qaeda. Then Taliban turned against Pakistan, and for the last 10-15 years, we've had about in Pakistan we have about 60,000 casualties, 60,000 people dead or injured. We have about 5,000 troops who died in fighting against these Taliban and these Al-Qaeda and all these terrorists. But what we have been doing there has been helping the entire world. Because, you know, if we had, would not have engaged them there, then these people would be wreaking havoc in the world. You know, what World Street, who was elected with a heavy mandate, he has this vision of a peaceful neighborhood. We've had rather turbulent relations with um, India. But we also have a slightly challenging relationship with Afghanistan. It's kind of strange because we have helped Afghans over the years, for many, many decades. Even as I speak, there are two million Afghan refugees in Pakistan. Yesterday, I think I gave an interview to Washington Post, and I mentioned that. They just, I mean, two million refugees in Europe have created a havoc to the extent that parties like RFPD, and sort of, you know, all the right wingers in other countries, they're gaining, and there's a huge problem. But we have had three to five million Afghan refugees in Pakistan for the last 30, 40 years. Even now, we have two million refugees. And even, even now, we are not trying to possibly evict them from Pakistan. We want them to go back voluntarily. Despite that, the governments in Afghanistan, they always find it very convenient to point fingers at Pakistan and say, oh, you know, in Afghanistan, we are not being able to defeat the Taliban because the Taliban have some uh, safe havens in Pakistan. But we are beating the Taliban in Pakistan anyways, you know, we are fighting the Taliban. So this has been a little kind of a challenging relationship, despite all the, all what we have done for Afghanistan. But other than the refugees, we have spent billions of dollars in Afghanistan for educating Afghans, for sort of setting up schools there, setting up infrastructure there, roads there, building roads there, building buildings there. We have given scholarship to about three, even now, just now, 3,000 Afghan students 
So despite that, we've had some problems. But now in recent months, uh, you know, like there has been a lot of uh, initiatives, breakthroughs, whereby, um, you know, like Pakistan and Afghanistan, <coughs> we're trying to sort of, you know, like um, get together in a common fight against the Taliban, against the terrorists. And the guiding principles are three: non-interference, not allowing our respective territories to be used against to be used against each other, and that our enemies are their enemies and their enemies are our enemies. And what is the question down? And basically, we escalate tension. We have offered our good offices for um, you know, resolving their differences. Prime Minister of Pakistan just visited Saudi Arabia, and the uh, President of Iran, Abdul Aziz from Pakistan. So basically, you know, our endeavor is to sort of, you know, to, to improve our sort of, <coughs> to diffuse that hostility in the as well. Well, thank you. That was basically the brief presentation I promised. Um, you know, like, now we could have a more interactive session. Any questions, comments? Yeah. Well, uh... I would be happy if you could introduce yourself and then shoot the question. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Anas. I come from uh, Syria, and uh, I wanted to ask you a question. You just mentioned the uh, relations with the Middle East. I remember around the uh, nation coalition to combat uh, terrorism on uh, every front, like uh, ideological, military. But uh, I've been wondering for the past month and a half what happened to it. It seems like it has evaporated and not no, no, been it's established. Not no, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, which also shows that, you know, it's a Saudi initiative. You know, like, it was a coalition of, I think, called 34 countries. Um, you know, terrorism is a common enemy. You know, we all want to eliminate terrorism. These all countries are suffering from <coughs> terrorism, some to a smaller degree, others to a greater degree. Uh, and we have to fight these menace together. Saudi Arabia, when they took this initiative, they, they basically you know, Pakistan being a very close friend, you know, we, we have a, like I said, a strategic partners, we have that type of a relationship. So they contacted us. And also the Saudis feel, and many other countries in the region feel, that in some ways, you know, like Pakistan, if you talk about the Muslim countries in the region, the Middle East, it's perhaps the, you know, like one country with the most uh, military force, it's a nuclear power, and so on, like, and in terms of the numbers, we're cooperating in that as well. We will be cooperating through bringing about more harmony between countries, the Muslim countries. And why? Because the terrorists exploit that. You know, they exploit the differences between countries, you know, and, and, and they gain out of it. So basically, it's going to be a holistic endeavor of that sort. Thank you. Yes. I have a series of questions, but I'll just stick with two. Um, you talk about the defeat of um, terrorism in, um, in Pakistan. Do you think that is due mainly to the fact that the terrorists had somewhere else to go? Um, in, in this case, Afghanistan, and if the Americans and the coalition forces are in Afghanistan, there's no way there really for them to go. And my second question was um, that you mentioned the extension of refugee status to Afghanis in Pakistan. Is there um, any way that they could um, that they can achieve Pakistani citizenship or maybe another legal status within Pakistan without being labeled as refugees? Good. Okay, for the first question, you see, like, when, um, when I said we defeated the terrorists, and uh, I mean, actually, you know, and I said they were on the run, the ones who kind of were, were not killed. They killed thousands of them, literally. You know, like they destroyed the infrastructure, you know, um, confiscated their weapons, and so if you like, um, you know, we have, we have really gone in a very holistic manner. But naturally, some of them were able to kind of, you know, like, uh, they're on the run. And because all of this was happening on Pakistan Afghan border, so yes, some of them were able to, you know, like, uh, escape to Afghanistan. Now, you are very right in saying that if the, if the US coalition forces had been there, you know, then they could have stopped them. Um, you know, because you see, it has to be a, you know, like basically because when we, let's say, beat them from this side, and if they beat them from that side, that's the way to crush them, right? 
there are US I mean, the US still have some forces there. But more importantly, now you have an Afghan army of hundreds of thousands. It's not a small army. It's in hundreds of thousands. You know. So it is basically, we had asked them, let's coordinate. Because you know, the thing is, we said that you have to guard your, you know, basically, because we have 200,000 troops on the border. But you also have to put your, you know, some of your troops on the border so that you make sure that those terrorists trying to run into Afghanistan are not, you know, and, and they're basically eliminated or they're arrested or whatever. But they haven't been able to <coughs> deliver, unfortunately. Um, as you saw what happened in Kandus. Thank you.